What's up artists, my name's Ryan Talbot, and today I want to talk about going from daily renders or one-off animations to creating and managing a fully fleshed out project with 50 to 60 shots. So the question is, how do you manage something like that? Because there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of coordination in order to pull something like that off. I just finished up a short film called The Search Part 2. It's on YouTube and Vimeo. And I want to talk about uh, some of the things that I learned on that project. And so like the first thing that a lot of people ask me is, do you storyboard your projects? And the answer is kind of. So I have a big whiteboard and I usually start there. And once I have the concept in my head, I'll start writing down bullet points. Um, these are these are story beats, you know. So I'll start with drone uh, transforms and then flies off into space. That's one beat. Uh, the drone enters the space station. That's another beat. The truth is, I can't do sketching to save my life. So I, for the most part, I don't draw storyboards. Um, but what I will do is I'll block out the scene in Cinema 4D, and that's the advantage we all have as 3D artists: is we don't have to draw. We can do everything in the software. Here's another example of pre-visualizing a scene with primitive geometry and keyframes. Without spending much time, we already know what the scene is about, how long it's going to run, and what camera angles to use. Finally, one more example where basic shapes tell us exactly what the composition will look like before we've done any of the tedious work. Another thing you're going to want to do during the blocking stage is create a camera plot. So you want to figure out what coverage you're going to need in your scene, the basic action. We want to capture all the different angles that we might cut to during the scene. And if you want to get really fancy, color coding the cameras and numbering can also be really useful. Next up is animation. This is always the most daunting task for me, so I start with something rough. Then the key is to just go back and refine it later. I never expect my first pass to look good, and I definitely never show it to the client. It's purely just for me to get a sense of the timing and flow of the scene. For me, it's always more important to keep my sight on the bigger picture in order to spend my time on the things that matter most, because it's very easy to get lost in the details early on, and when you're doing a rough animation, that's not what you want to do. Take this typing animation, for example, which looks like total trash. I used this for the initial edit just so that I had an idea of what the basic action was, and I was able to animate the camera around this even. And then of course I went back, and this is what the final looked like. Wait, wait, wait. And so some things I learned about uh, creating a dialogue scene is to create one master file where you have all the camera angles and all the different animations where you basically run through the whole scene in this one master file. And then as you start refining each shot and each animation, you break off that into a new Cinema 4D file. And if you need to update anything later, you copy it over from the master file and so forth. When you're thinking about submitting it to a render farm, um, it's much easier to just go, okay, here's shot three as a collected file. Having these collected files is like having a completed snapshot of just that camera angle and that animation. This method also allows more flexibility for you to go back and change the length of one of your shots or the animation for one shot without creating a ripple effect that then affects the rest of your scene. This might come in handy because chances are after you get the voiceover back from your actors, you're gonna have to retime the edit anyways. All right, so another practical tip when you're animating in Cinema 4D is to use layers all the time. You may have dropped a displacer or a cloner in your scene before and noticed that your playback instantly goes from close to real time to the snail's pace of five frames a second or less. Once that happens, it just becomes increasingly difficult to get a sense of what the timing actually looks like, and you just spend the whole day waiting for hardware previews instead of actually animating. So a way around this is to drop all of your deformers and generators onto a layer and shut them off to preview your animation without all the extra stuff that you're going to throw in the final render. If you take a look inside the layers tab, there's a lot of different buttons, but the two culprits that generally kill the most speed are the deformers and generators, which look like the atom array and twist deformer. So you're going to want to put everything on a layer and then hit those two buttons to shut them off and you should be good to go. If your scene still isn't speeding up after that, try turning off all the buttons on that layer. 
real quick, a practical shortcut within Cinema 4D to make a hardware preview is Alt-B. And I didn't know this for a long time. Um, so just hit Alt-B and you can choose the frame range um, and make sure you have hardware preview selected. So if you're making a preview of your shot, you can jump into another project and start animating that or even make changes on the current project that you're working on. Um, and then you can save it out from there into your hardware previews folder. When you're animating, it's important to show people what you're working on. You know, I think some people are afraid to show their friends, their peers, uh, a work in progress because they're afraid to be judged too early but it's important to catch problems early on, you know? I think you yourself will get a better gauge of what you're making once you show it to another person. Even if they don't give you a ton of feedback on it, just pulling out your phone and showing it to another person will immediately make you see your animation from a whole new perspective because suddenly you're judging yourself as the viewer. You're, you're not really judging yourself as the animator anymore. You're, you, it's like an out of body experience. When I take my animation and show it, in a room with somebody else for the first time, you like I just suddenly see everything in a whole new light. Um, so it's important to to show people what you're working on while you're working on it to get those critiques um, and get constructive criticism to make your animation better. Moving on to the next management tip is setting up your render settings properly. There are ways to set up your render settings to make things a little bit more automated so you're not naming your files every time you output something. What I like to do is name my camera the name of the shot and then in my render output, hit dollar sign and then type camera slash dollar sign camera again. And what that's gonna do is at the end of every output path, it creates a folder called your camera, whatever your camera name is, and then it's gonna put your image sequence inside that folder also named after the camera. Uh, also generally, I like to do a low res render settings and then a high res render setting. So I guess this is a good segue to talk about file structure. When you're structuring a bigger project, you're gonna want three different render folders. Hardware previews, low res, and high res for the final animation. Hardware preview is what you'll be outputting in the blocking stage when you're still putting together your edit and extending, cutting, and even rearranging your sequence. Low res is that in-between phase you want to output as a test run to check your lighting, textures, and focus without fully committing to long render times. And finally, once everything is exactly how you want it, high res is reserved for those final frames when it's time to wait around and render. About six months ago, I switched over from rendering everything locally on my own computer to using an online service called Pixelplow. And the reason I did this is because it just became so much easier to manage everything and get all my shots rendered on a deadline without stressing out my computer and freeing myself up to work on other projects while one is rendering. And it's just a very reasonably priced farm. I actually reached out to them asking if I could make a video about this because I genuinely love the service and I think it's a great solution for any independent artist trying to manage a bigger project without the hassle of also managing their own render farm. The next thing you might be concerned about is how much money you're going to spend on your render. Pixelplow has a cost calculator, which is pretty easy to use. All you need to do is go in and enter some details about your render, such as the frame range, the average time to render a frame on your own computer, your Octane bench score, and what render engine you're using. Then it'll give you a pretty accurate estimate of how expensive your render is going to be. The first thing that you want to do when getting ready to submit is you want to make sure that all your animation is baked down in your project file. In our first example, I'll show you how to bake a tracer object, which is sweeping along some particles. So all I'm going to do is right click on the tracer and I'm going to hit bake as alembic and it's going to ask for an output path. I'll just set it to the desktop and immediately it just created a spline right here in our hierarchy uh, that I can then replace our tracer with. So I'm going to turn off that tracer and just use the spline. As you can see, our animation is now stored inside the Alembic file. Most objects in Cinema 4D can be exported as an Alembic, so when all else fails, try this method. Another method of baking is to use the point cache tag. This is especially useful for deformers and can always be returned to its procedural state. First of all, we need to make sure that our geometry is editable, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a point cache tag on my objects. So this is under the character tags, and then the point cache. And the first thing I'm going to click is store state, and then I'm going to tell it to calculate. 
So now you can see the effect is doubling up because we still have our deformers on. So I'm going to shut those off and now you can see without any deformers on, our ball still has a displacer and a jiggle on it. Let's do the same thing for our plane. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to put a point cache tag on it. I'm going to hit store state. I'm going to tell it to calculate. It's going to do its thing. And then I'm going to turn off the collision deformer. A third way of baking objects is through the dope sheets bake objects function. In this example, I'll use it to bake a vibrate tag into my camera. So I'm going to open up the dope sheet, select my camera. I'm just going to go up to functions, bake objects, and I'm going to make sure that everything is selected that I want and I'm going to hit OK. Now you can see it's created a copy of our camera, so I can turn off the original, um, and we have keyframes. This can also be used to bake objects with deformers into point level animation, which is a more destructive way than using a point cache tag. For a more detailed tutorial on baking, including X particles and turbulence FD caches, check out Daniel Danielson's Cloud Rendering 101 on YouTube. The next thing you're going to want to do is collect your project. We went over this a little bit earlier, but more specifically, let's talk about the hiccups. Sometimes image sequences don't copy into your collected file. Sometimes only the first frame copies over, and then you go to render only to find out that your texture is no longer animated. Double check what textures are missing by opening up C4D's texture manager. Or if you're using Redshift like me, open up the Redshift asset manager. Then copy over the missing files and manually relink them to the correct texture folder. Pixel Plow will automatically cancel your render if it detects any missing assets. Animated VDBs are tricky too, because they copy over one file at a time. So depending on the size of the VDB sequence and the quality, this could take a while. So now I'm going to walk you through installing and using the program. If you're not signed up already, click on that sign up tab, and you're going to want to create a Pixel Plow account. It does cost $10 to sign up, however, those $10 go towards render credits once your account is set up. So as long as you use those $10 of render credits, it actually doesn't cost anything to sign up. So once you fill out this information and complete your order, um, you should get an email from Pixel Plow with a download link to their agent. Once you have the agent downloaded and installed, it should look something like this. So I'm using Cinema 4D R20, but you can select whatever program you're using, and then it's going to ask to choose a scene file. So we'll hit that, and let's navigate to our project file. So as an example, I'll use Approach Carmen Collected. So I'm going to open that up, and it's going to ask for the frame list. Say I want to render frames 0 to 25, and the output resolution is going to be determined by your render settings back in Cinema 4D, so make sure that's already set up. The next thing you have here is the power slider. Now this is going to determine how fast and how expensive your render is. There's been a couple times where I crank it up to something like 2.1. Um, it essentially just gets more expensive but faster to render. So I find that 0.8 is actually still a little bit faster than my local machine and is the cheapest option. Next you're going to want to set your output path. So for this example I'll just create a new folder on my desktop and I'll name it output. Within that folder, I'm going to create a new folder called the name of my shot. I want to double click on that folder again, and I want to make sure that I'm rendering inside of that folder I just created. Then we're going to name our file. One thing to note is that Pixel Plow does allow the use of render tokens in this output field. So you could also type dollar sign camera to reference your selected camera name. So when we're done with that, we'll come down here and we'll just hit submit. And now you can see it's uploading the file. Um, we, can, we can look at all of our previous jobs above. Um, we can see how many frames we're rendering, our power setting. It's going to let us know our rate and the cost consumed once it starts going. At any time, you can right click on the project and you can tell it to hold or you can tell it to cancel and it'll become a canceled job. Once a frame finishes, it'll let you know the cost expected for the whole job. You can also set a limit to how much money you spend on a certain shot. So if I right click and I hit change budget slash auto power, I can enter an amount. Say I don't want to spend any more than $15 on this shot. Once I hit OK, it's going to cap the budget at $15 so it stops once it hits that number. And that brings us to the end of today's video. We covered a lot of ground from capturing your ideas to blocking out your animations to animating, to workflow tips to make your animations go faster, to managing all those renders with Pixel Plow. Huge shout out to Pixel Plow, by the way, for sponsoring this video. 
And um, I just hope you really got something out of this. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out, uh, shoot me a message or a comment, and uh, I'll try to get back to you. So uh, peace out. <laughs>